Trouble isn't easy, trouble brings doubt Fear comes in and the joy goes out How are we gonna make it, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make it when trouble comes through? We'll take it bird by bird Little at a time, take it bird by bird And stone by stone Little at a time, take it stone by stone. Change isn't easy, change is hard. Fear comes in, it can tear you apart. How are we 
we gonna make it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make it when change comes through? We'll take it bird by bird. Little bit of time, take it bird by bird and stone by stone. A little bit of time, take it stone by stone. Dreams can get lost Fear comes in and the dream gets tossed How are we gonna make it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make this dream come true? We'll take it bird by bird A little at a time, take it bird by bird and stone An important way we stay together is by sharing milestones in our lives. Send me a private chat by clicking on the chat button or clicking on my image and either the three dots or the more, and you can send a private chat and we will include your joy or concern during that part of our service. Tad Staley will lead this morning's worship, The Mythology of Change. You are invited to join in the readings and hymns while muted and remain muted for the entire service. We will invite everyone to unmute for fellowship and conversation during, social, during our social hour, which is directly after the worship staying on Zoom. Um, so please make yourselves comfortable, breathe deeply as we settle into worship. We are so very glad that you are all here. Welcome. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, the chalice reading, a lighting uh, today is a reading from the Tao Te Ching, uh, book 23. Express yourself completely, then become quiet. Open yourself to heaven and earth, and be like the forces of nature. When the wind blows, there is only the wind. When it rains, there is only the rain. When the clouds pass, the sun promises to shine. If you open yourself to insight, you are at one with insight and you can use it completely. Open yourself to heaven and earth and then trust your natural responses and everything will fall into place. Will you please join me in our unison covenant? The covenant is a Unitarian Universalist um, tradition of promises that we make to one another and that we take out into the world and try to live out. It's not always easy, but especially during this time, we're going to try to do that. Um, so that we can't gather in person, um, we're just going to try to live these promises. So please join me in the Parish Covenant. It's going to come onto your screen. We gather as a loving community to encourage and comfort one another. We gather as a, as a diverse community to support each other in our search for spiritual truth. We gather as a service community to live our beliefs through action and care for our world. Now is the time for the shares of joys and concerns. These are milestones in our lives. Um, there was, you can always email them in before uh, Saturday evening and we will include them, but um, if there's something that's come to mind or happened since last night that you would like to share, go ahead and click on the chat button in the bottom or just, uh, I I'm not sure if you can click on my image when it's spotlighted, but 
Um, but please go ahead and, and share your chat. And we do have one that we are going to start with. Um, this is a stone for Claire and uh, Jan Golkowski, who happily announced the birth of their second grandchild, Eleanor Ruth Shivers. She was welcomed by her mom and dad, Laura Sullivan Shivers and Rich Shivers, along with her older sister, Hazel. On the 11th of August, 2020, at about 9 a.m., and she weighs an eight pounds even and 20 inches. And from Deborah Niles, her son passed his nursing exam. Congratulations. And I would like to add one. My son Keller passed his qualifying exams at the end of his first year of his doctoral program. So he doesn't have to repeat any classes. All right. So we'll add one final stone for all of those joys and concerns that remain in our hearts or remain silent until they can be spoken. Now, if you will join me in a moment of reflection, descend into the stillness, breathe into deeper awareness, attend to the sharp edge of this moment. Notice the small momentary gap in your breath. While acknowledging both the heartache of loss and the ever -newing, renewing gift of life, retain this heartfelt attunement as we abide in this moment together. I guess I'll just have to say amen for you, Tad. I'm not able to get uh, Irina's music for us here. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Our first reading this morning is the story of Child Roland. There once was a boy named Child Roland one day while playing in a churchyard with his two older brothers and his sister, Bird Ellen, Roland kicked a ball over the church. Bird Ellen ran to fetch the ball, but went Wittershins the wrong way around the church and disappeared. In despair, her brothers sought out the warlock, Merlin. Ah, said Merlin. She was carried off by the fairies because she went around the church Wittershins. She is in Elfland, in the dark tower of the Elf King. It would take the bravest knight in Christendom to rescue her. The brothers pleaded for advice on navigating to and through the otherworldly realm. And so Merlin gave them two injunctions. There are but two things. One thing you must do, and one thing you must not do. The thing you must do in the land of the elf, after someone speaks to you, you must cut off their head. And what you're not to do is this, eat or drink nothing in Elfland. If you do, you will never see Middle-earth again. The oldest brother made the first attempt. He bade goodbye to his mother and his brothers, and he set out for the dark tower of Elfland to bring back Bird Ellen, but he did not return. The second brother then set off, but also does not return. 
Roland begged his mother, the queen, to let him go to that other realm in search of his sister. Reluctantly, she finally agrees, giving Roland his father's sword, which never struck in vain. After a long journey deep into the land of the elf, Roland meets a horse herd, then a cow herd, and then a hen, hen wife. In turn, they offer Roland directions on finding the elf king's dark tower. Then, in turn, Roland lops off each head. When he finally arrives at the elf king's dark tower, Roland discovers fair bird Ellen, his beloved sister, who greets Roland with a lifeless voice. Roland knows what he must do. Trembling, he draws the sword that never struck in vain and beheads the phantasm. And when he opens his eyes, behold, there sat his true sister. Suddenly they hear a noise like thunder and the sound of a terrifying voice approaching. The doors of the hall burst open and the king of Elfland blows in like a windstorm. Roland leaps to his feet. Strike, Bogle, if thou darest, he shouts, brandishing his good sword that never failed. They fight until Roland brings the elf king to his knees, where he begs for mercy. Release my sister from my spells, cries Roland. Raise my brothers to life, set us free and thou shall be spared. And thus, child Roland emerged, transformed by his otherworldly ordeal. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really well done. Um, I'd like to start with an invocation from the Roman, Roman poet Ovid from his epic poem, Metamorphosis, book one, chapter one, verse one. My spirit drives me now to sing about the forms of things changed into new beings. Since you, God, caused these transformations, inspire what I am going to relate and bring forth an uninterrupted song from the primal origins of the world down to this present age. So, let's begin with folk tales. Folk tales and fairy tales and myths have fallen out of favor recently, which may be one reason why I'm drawn to them, but they have a deep symbolic meaning and relevance that I find compelling. Uh, they have this relevance, I think, because in oral traditions, the story was retold countless times each time getting refined to better attuned to its audience. So it evolved. With each retelling, the story got deeper and more true. I want to focus here on folk tales about heroes, male and female, setting out from home to right some wrong or to seek something lost. Uh, and the journey often involves some sort of a descent uh, or withdrawal into an otherworldly realm. Child Roland is uh, an example of this, ostensibly, the boy descends in the realm of the elf king to rescue his sisters, his sister and his brothers. And wasn't that a ghastly image, you know, cutting heads off of people, including his sister. Um, but as taught by Joseph Campbell and others, the hero's downward journey is a parable of transformation. In this case, it represents how an adolescent, Roland, evolves into adulthood. It can be a difficult process, encountering demons and more, and may require things like severing and transforming outmoded childhood relationships. And the downward journey has an older lineage. In Roman myth, uh, the hero Aeneas was guided to the underworld by the Chimaean Sibyl to meet his recently deceased father, Anchises. 
in Greek myth, Orpheus descends to Hades to attempt to rescue his bride, Eurydice. Odysseus visits the blind sage, Tiresias, in the underworld for guidance on navigating his way back home. And Theseus goes into the underground labyrinth to confront and vanquish the dreaded Minotaur. And that heroic act finally freed the city of Athens from bondage to Crete. So for a long time, since the time of Persephone and Hades, this going down has been part of the mythical lore. And it's been referred to as a catabasis, uh, also pronounced catabasis, but I have a hard time with that one. Uh, a catabasis is a descent or a detachment of some kind and a withdrawal into the underworld. Theseus, Odysseus, Orpheus all had their catabasis. In Greek, the prefix kata means downward, basis means to go. So in ancient traditions, as in folktales, the catabatic experience symbolically represents the process of how we transform. The hero generally, if they succeed, emerges with some boon or new knowledge or transformative insight. It seems to me that we are on undergoing a cultural catabasis right now. We have collectively withdrawn from the outer world here by Zoom. This outer world is fraught with its own misalignments. And in this period of withdrawal, we have encountered the demons of injustice and hate and oppression. It's easy, to, it's easy and natural to think of this as uh, catastrophic, even cataclysmic, which word you might have noticed begins with the word cata, going down. Uh, the pandemic is a catalyst that which causes dissolution. Our species rarely sees catastrophes at this scale, but it might be helpful to consider ourselves both individually and collectively as heroes in this tale of necessary dissolution and hoped for transformation. So the question for me today is, how does and will this transformation work? What happens in this chrysalis when we are withdrawn into the netherworld by crisis? How can we ensure systemic and effective change actually occurs in us and the world? That'll be the question. Now, please join in singing hymn 210, Wade in the Water, your microphones will be muted and the words I think are gonna be on the screen. Second reading this morning, Turtle and Snake. 
One fine spring day, Turtle crawled out of the river and onto the well-worn path. Her handsome shell glistened in the morning sun. A little way down the path, she came upon Snake, lying idly in the warm sun. Turtle grunted condescendingly. Excuse me, but would you mind slithering out of my way, please? Snake rolled her eyes up to Turtle, but said nothing. Turtle, annoyed at the rudeness of her fellow reptile, was about to launch into a self-righteous rant about consideration and propriety when she saw Peahen approaching down the path. The two exchanged greetings as Snake lay listlessly at their feet. Turtle began to speak, intending to enlist Peahen in her condemnation of Snake, but was interrupted by the agitated bird. Have you heard about the arrival of large mammals into our territory? I've seen rhinos wading in our river and wild boars grazing in our pine groves. They're threatening our way of life. Turtle, as the ancient symbol of wisdom, the unchanging foundation upon which the world rested, nodded her head knowing The world is changing so much, continued Peahen in a flutter. How will we cope with all these changes? Turtle solemnly adjusted her position within her handsome shell. Tenacity, my friend, dig in your heels and hold on tight. Peahen clucked and looked down at Snake. What do you think, my serpentine friend? Still lying inert, Snake rolled her eyes up to Peahen. The pause in the conversation was suddenly interrupted by a thundering sound approaching and growing louder. Rhinos, yelled Peahen, run for cover. No sooner had the agitated bird fluttered up to a branch over the path than the dust cloud morphed into the form of several onrushing rhinos. With a deafening roar and a blinding cloud of dust and debris, the beasts thundered through. Peahen closed her eyes and clung to her branch above the fray until the stampede had passed and disappeared into the distance. Turtle, who had retreated to the side of the path and into her familiar shell, collected herself and slowly emerged. Her face was covered with dust and her prized shell was slightly more creased and battered but still remained her most distinguishing feature. Peahen looked down at Turtle with her handsome shell and marveled at her rugged tenacity. In the moments that followed, an uneasy awareness crept over them. There in the path were the flattened remains of a snake. It was a perfect likeness the skin intact, only without any depth. Peahen was aghast in horror. But the very next moment, the tall grass parted and out from the undergrowth slithered snake, looking somehow renewed, younger, invigorated. Peahen gawked, then looked at the remains in the road and back to the specter in front of her. But you, you, spluttered Peahen, pointing at the empty skin. Snake, who in many ancient traditions was the symbol for renewal and transformation, smiled. My dear friends, she began, I honor Turtle's stalwart durability, but I think there is another way to approach disruptive change. Here ends the fable. Excellent, Phil. So uh, the rhetorical question I left with last time was, how does this change work? Um, in a virtual lane lyceum this spring, 
Marty Linsky of the Kennedy School of Government talked about change in the context of leadership. Marty described two kinds of challenges, each with its own remedial path. Technical challenge, he said, <clears throat> are problems that are straightforward to identify and solve, and they use existing resources and know-how. Technical problems often lend themselves to cut and dried solution, the kinds of solutions that can be implemented quickly, even by edict or executive order. Adaptive challenges, on the other hand, are harder to identify and much harder to confront. They're often systemic, multi-layered, and may require changes in roles and relationships and values, beliefs, and mindset. And adaptive changes certainly cannot be implemented by edict. According to Marty, leadership that is ineffective or worse treats adaptive challenges as technical challenges to be solved by simple solutions, political ta tactics, or edicts. And today, of course, we're faced with some enormous adaptive challenges, and we have an administration besotted with transactional mindset and edicts looking for quick technical solutions. But for the superficially minded, adaptive changes are too hard, too slow, too complex. They require us to go downward and inward, personally and collectively. And in those depths, there may be demons. Adaptive change requires a hero's journey, where we may need to confront those demons, as well as the maladapted assumptions and commitments that we may find there. And invoking child Roland, perhaps some old behaviors and relationships need to be severed. Even more dramatically in the ancient Egyptian myth of Osiris and Isis, uh, as well as the Babylonian myth of Tammuz, the hero is, hero is the one who's actually dismembered in the descent. But this in the myth allows for the reintegration of the old parts as the hero reemerges into a, a new birth. Later this spring, we hosted another virtual Lane Lyceum with Professor Deborah Helsing of the Harvard School of Education, who described a, our native resistance to deep adaptive challenges, personally and collectively, as the immunity to change. Based on the book of the same name, co-authored by her colleagues Keegan and Leahy, the immunity to change is an internal dynamic which actively prevents us from changing because of its devotion to preserving our existing way of making meaning. The reason change is so difficult, as outlined in this uh, approach, both personally and collectively, is that the systems we have in place, which are mostly unexamined and unconscious, both protect us and provide meaning and context for our lives. So we generally don't go there. This immunity system is comprised of inherited beliefs, underlying assumptions, unquestioned commitments, that inform and guide our attitudes and behaviors. To say that I went through the immunity to change process this spring, and it was fascinating, and it does indeed uncover some inconvenient and even counterproductive orientations. Uh, at another time, I'm happy to ch chat about that, uh, but not without declaring myself as an expert, but it was an interesting process. Um, so the immune system is present to us in the form of the stories we have inherited or that we interpreted or constructed over time. These narratives are the heart of our life story, which we generally accept uncritically and often unconsciously. It's interesting to note that scholars of mythology say that a story can only be described as a myth by those who stand outside of that myth's culture. For those within the culture, the stories have deep meaning and resonance. They represent really the unquestioned truth. So in a way we can say that the unexamined assumptions and tacit commitments that comprise our personal narratives when viewed from outside the system really constitute our own personal mythology, which is personally 
but not objectively true. This personal mythology can harden into a protective shell. Like the turtle, it's easy to retreat into the security of the unconscious narratives that are running our lives. But to academic psychologists like Keegan and Leahy, who study the development of mindsets and mental complexity in adulthood, the process of personal evolution and transformation is the process of bringing tacit and subjective thoughts and feelings into conscious awareness, where we can look at them and appraise them objectively. In a way, it's the process of turning a religion into a mythology. Transformation requires stepping outside our personal mythology, leaving the comfort of our familiar shell. It can be scary. We can feel naked, exposed, and unprotected in the process. This is the catabatic hero's journey. And it's not easy or comfortable. But now, especially, we are called to that journey. The need is so compelling, I don't think we have a choice. Our own mythology, which is steeped in the mythos of our culture, needs to be exposed so we, individually and collectively, can evolve. And now, to transition to the offering. <laughs> this congregation has been supported by the freely offered time and treasure of its members and friends since its founding in 1711. This is the time in our service when we, the modern stewards of the church, offer to give what we can to build and sustain the world we envision. This summer, our plate collection is shared equally between First Parish and Needham Community Council. There are three ways you can donate to today's offering. If you have a smartphone, you can use our new text to give program by following along with the instructions that will appear in the Zoom session. If you'd prefer to mail First Parish a check, please make it out to First Parish in Needham, put the date of the service and the word collection in the memo line, and then mail your check to 23 Dedham Ave, Needham, Mass, 0492. Alternatively, if you want the money applied to your pledge for either the fiscal year just finished or the upcoming year, put FY20 or FY21 in that memo line instead. And the last and perhaps easiest method is to use our website, uuneedham.org, to make your donation. There's a giving button in the upper right corner with a drop down menu where you'll find an entry labeled Donate Now. Follow that link and signing into your Realm account, you'll be able to fill in your donation information and choose recipient fund for its destination, such as plate collection. Thank you for everything you are able to give and to help support and sustain this congregation and the vital work of our community partners. Please take the next few moments to give what you can and know it will be gratefully received. This third and final reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire 
out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then God said, do not come here, sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Take off your shoes, take off your sandals. Much has been written about those lines in Exodus, which may be the best known passage in the Torah. Also, while the catabatic experience we've been discussing is often conceived of as a descent, it's really just a withdrawal from the mundane. For Moses, that withdrawal, his catabatic experience, took him not downward, but upward to a mountaintop. And clearly Moses has stumbled upon sacred ground and into a heightened state of awareness. Removing his sandals would be at the very least a sign of respect. But I recently learned that in the original language, which the text is translated, the phrase, take off your shoes, actually means to molt, to shed a skin. I think this is fitting because to enter a heightened state of awareness is to be stripped of pretenses and philosophy and politics and posturing it involves a kind of naked naivete. There's a severing of some of those ties and externalities that bind us to our usual way of thinking and being. Moses and his nation were in the midst of a profound transformation and God, or at least the collective authors of the folktale, invoked molting as the model for enabling that change. The catabatic process is a liminal experience because it's transitional, transforming from one state to another. And at the heart of many religions and mythologies, there is the understanding that this liminal state is sacred. So this brings us to what I think are the three keys to the transformation process to which we are called. The first is a recognition that in its essence, the process is spiritual. It's not mechanical or technical. It requires not tenacity, but a letting go. Underlying the process of stepping back to assess a personal mythology is a kind of faith a deep assurance that you can let go of your protective shell, which are those assumptions and norms that unconsciously form and inform your worldview. This faith, or assurance if you prefer, cannot be calculated or rationalized. It's deeper than emotion and it's deeper than thought. You just have to trust the process. The second key in this transformation process involves the people to whom you turn for support and community. Let your loved ones know what is incubating in you and hopefully they will help allow and enable your evolution. Come to terms with and perhaps even sever the constricting aspects of relationships that are based on outmoded or malignant myths. And finally, I would say that this process, this transformation process is sacred, not in a religious or mythical way, but sacred because this eternal cycle of dissolution and renewal 
is pretty close to the definition and meaning of life. Catabasis is sacred because the descent enables new healthy growth and leads to greater wholeness. The difficult path of redemption, therefore, I think, is spiritual, supported, and sacred. The catabasis, catabasis of 2020 was, in some form, inevitable. We've been dragged downward, in, be, in part because as a society, we would not do the work of deep adaptive change that has been required for so long. But the descent is an opportunity for renewal. As John O'Donohue wrote in one of his marvelous blessings, May you find in yourself a courageous hospitality toward what is difficult, painful, and unknown. May you learn to use this illness or hardship as a lantern to illuminate the new qualities that will emerge in you. May it be so. Now, please join in singing hymn 205, Amazing Grace, which will appear on the screen. As we close worship today, please stay current on your church happenings through our emails and on the website. And you can also follow us on social media. Um, that will let you know all of the opportunities to connect with our faith community. During these times of physical isolation, if you fall ill or need any pastoral support, please reach out to our pastoral care team and caring crew. Uh, this week, Lynn Franceschi, I believe, is our um, pastoral care associate. We encourage all of you to check in with your friends at First Parish. Contact information is online on our Realm directory and the website, so please check that your contact information is also current so that we can reach out to you. When today's service ends, you are all invited to stay with us for a Zoom social hour. 
we always extinguish our chalice with words promising to carry its flame in our hearts until we are together again, no matter how long that is until we are together again. So please join with me in saying those words written by Unitarian Universalist minister, the Reverend Selly, Elizabeth Selly Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. benediction is from the Tao Te Ching, book 16. Empty your mind of all thoughts. Let your heart be at peace. Watch the turmoil of beings, but contemplate their return. Each separate being in the universe returns to the common source. Returning to the source is serenity. If you don't realize the source, you stumble in confusion and sorrow. When you realize where you come from, you naturally become tolerant, disinterested, disinterested amused, kind-hearted as a grandmother, dignified as a sage. May we all be so blessed. Amen.
this does conclude our formal portion of our worship service. But we hope that you'll all stay on for the social hour. Um, first, thank you, Tad, for offering such meaningful worship this morning. And the technical aspects of this service were handled by Phil Lyons and Becky Stevens. So thank you, Phil and Becky. Um, feel free to stretch, grab a drink, or attend to your personal needs, or stay here and chat. Um, we'll be back in a few minutes to start the formal part of our social hour. So please go ahead and unmute yourselves and greet your virtual neighbors. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. Bill, can you go ahead and make me a co-host, please? Aren't you? No. Hi, nice service. Service, Tad. Thank you, Tad. Thank you, Tad. Thank you. Thank you, Tad. Very good. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Tad. My apologies for all the technical gotchas of my uh, sharing of music. <laughs> it's the we all need to be understanding during these technical times. Yeah. <laughs> a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> Left all your cats up for Gales. Yes. It was such a powerful service, Tad. Thank you so much. That was really good. Yeah. Great job, Tad. Worshiping together. Um, so once the announcements are concluded, then Phil will randomly assign everyone to a breakout room for more conversation and fellowship, and then we'll come back together as a large group. Um, here are some of the, the activities and lay-led virtual gatherings that are listed in the bell notes that we just want to make sure you're aware of. There's the meditation ministry group which will meet on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. Lynn Jakowski will continue to lead activities for artists of all talents on most Friday mornings at 10 a.m. through the end of August. The Writing Escape Group, led by Nora Hussey, will meet on Thursdays at 11 a.m. on Zoom. And Sue King is organizing a blood drive to be held on Saturday, August 29th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Parish Hall. Pre-registration with the Red Cross is required for that. And the link is in the bell notes, or you can email Sue directly. And the Zoom links and passwords for all of the, the activities that are online are listed in the bell notes email. So please check your email. Even though the Needham Children's Center and the ballet school have reopened, and we are hosting the blood drive at the end of the month, the church building is still closed for congregational activities until the end of September, at least. Please keep practicing your social distancing, wearing your masks, and helping to protect your family and the wider community. If you need to contact the church office, use phones or emails, and be aware that Susanna will be taking a week off starting tomorrow, August 17th. She will return along with Reverend Katie and Roberta on August 24th, and then we will have our staff back again. And during this time, we realize just how wonderful they are and how much we miss them all. For personal support during this time, don't hesitate to reach out to our pastoral care team and the Karen crew. They are here to assist all of us. To reach them, you can email pastoralcare at uuneedham.org or leave a voicemail at the church office. As you probably heard in the service or just earlier, Lynn Franceschi is our pastoral care associate for this coming week. Finally, I want to remind you that our services are recorded. So subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can stream them there anytime and all of the past services. Now let's break out into our smaller groups. You will be automatically and randomly assigned to a breakout room with five or six other people um, for a little more formal socializing and an opportunity to discuss today's service.